Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I wanted to talk about Arcanum's procedural terrain generation system. Gotten some questions about this for years. The fact that we did this in the late 90s I thought was pretty cool. It also was pretty required because there was no way, no way we could store as much map, especially overland map, as we wanted in the computers of the time. We just didn't have the memory. So basically the procedural generation was a way for us to generate maps and treat what we edited as deltas to those maps. And I will explain all this, but I went through the code to make sure I was accurate. I've got to start at the very bottom. This is going to get technical. I'm not going to go into code itself, but it does get a little technical. So a tile in Arcanum, especially if you use the world editor, you know this, it's a diamond. It is 80 pixels by 40 pixels. We estimated a tile to be approximately five feet. Um, you know, if, cause it's a square, if it's viewed top down. So that means that there are about a thousand tiles per mile. Now tiles could only connect in their diamond shape. They could only connect to certain other tiles. They did this based on the four, um, not just the four edges, but they also, they treated each, we looked at each point of it because it connected at that point to three other tiles. And there were only certain transitions that were possible. So for example, if we had a lot of tiles, we had deep water, shallow water, um, coastal, so it's a mixture of water and sand, sand, scrub, grass, light forest, deep forest, rocky, hilly mountain. So we had a lot of terrain. Tiles could only connect to certain other terrain. There was a Basically, it was marked, each of the four corners were marked as having transition tiles, tiles that were allowed to have adjoining to them, which meant, so say grassland could only connect to sand, which could only connect to coast. I mean, it, grass could also connect to light forest and scrub, but if you dropped deep water, the only thing that could be around the deep water would be shallow water. And then around that shallow water, you could do deep water again, but you could also have coast, which could then transition to sand. So if you ever dropped, let's say you had a, a map of nothing but grass and you dropped deep water in the middle of it, you'd see it go deep water, shallow water, coast, sand, grass. The tile types were also used to control player movement. They were marked as whether the player could walk across them or whether they were blocked, whether they could fly across them or whether that was also blocked. They Whether they would sink in it, so we would draw them up to their knees, or whether they it was icy, so that's when they would slip and fall. Tiles also controlled sound, so the sound your footsteps made as you walked across it, we had six different sound types. We had walking on dirt, sand, snow, stone, water, and wood. That covered everything we needed, including inside structures. Now to save on art, because we are to save on space, and I guess art we had to create, some of the tiles could be flipped horizontally. That was only possible if it looked fine when it was flipped and we knew the transitions would work. Uh, even if the art was done uh, flippable, the artist worked really hard to make sure that was the case as frequently as possible so we could store less tiles. You also got more variety because if you could take a, a tile and flip it, it looked a little different. And as long as it's still connected correctly, you got more variety. Okay, so those were tiles. The next level up were sectors. Sectors were an array of 64 by 64 tiles meaning they were 5,120 pixels by 2,560 pixels, or about 320 by 200 feet, which is easy to remember if you knew VGA was 320 by 200 pixels. 
if if one of those pixels was a foot, a sector is a VGA screen. Each one of those sectors was uniquely numbered based on its XY location in the world map, which I'll get to explain in a second how big that was. The fact that sectors were unique, uniquely numbered is important. So just remember that every sector, you could say sector 5,102 and boom, that was a unique sector on whatever map was loaded. Now, at the map level, which is a bunch of sectors, we had a base terrain at that level. We supported up to 32 base terrains. They were things like grass, forest, mountain, water. We didn't have to specify deep or shallow. We didn't have to specify light or heavy forest. It was just very basic types like that. What the that base terrain was used for was auto generation, which I'll talk about in a bit. We could auto generate sectors and also whether a player could move through that sector on the world map. The things like wa uh, water and mountains were marked impassable. So when we were moving you along the world map, it tried to move you straight there and it would move you along you, around mountains and water where needed. Now a map in the game, which we called the world, but really it specifically was a map. It defaulted to 64 by 64 sectors. Defaulted. I'll get to that in a second. A map defined for itself, whether it was indoor or outdoor, for purposes of things like lighting. Outdoor maps, you know, got day-night lighting. Some backgrounds cared about whether you were indoors or outdoors, in addition to whether it being day or night. We also passed that information to audio. So if they wanted to make different sounds, like audio uh, ambient sounds at night could be different than daytime for the map, they could do that. Now, structures would override that. If you were an indoor map, you're always indoors. But if you're an outdoor map, if you went into a structure, that would override it. And you'd be indoors. Structures were made differently than a lot of other things. We had a top-down way of doing structures as rectangles. It's too long to go into it here, so just know that structures exist. Structures are basically buildings, but basically anything that we wanted to call a structure, we could make a structure ability for. Basically, it's rectangular things put in the world that you could go inside of. Now, the Arcanum world map was 2,000 by 2,000 sectors mostly foot up at that central continent. That meant that our canum was 128 square miles, 128 miles on the side. That is a large world for late 90s. And remember, you could just walk through this anywhere you wanted to go. However, our world map's maximum size was 67 million sectors square. Precisely 67,108,864. That translates to 4.2 billion tiles. Hint, unsigned to max int. Or about 4.2 million miles square. So in theory, with the Arcanum World Editor, you could make a map that was 4.2 million miles on a side. That's a big map. We never made a map that big. Now, maps were created in the world editor that we shipped with the game. We created it with the same world editor that game came with the game. You basically would create a map. Now, the way we would uh, treat, like when you, when you created the map, you would paint sectors down on it. You would paint one of the base terrains. So you could say, let's say you're making a continent. You could like, here's a bunch of grass. And then here's a mountain range. And then here's some water that goes down. And there's ocean all around it. Those were painting at the sector level. If you ever wanted to go into a sector, it would be procedurally generated based on its sector number, which is its location, modified by any differences. And before I say that, because we had multiple people working, the way our world editor worked 
at Troika was whenever anyone edited a sector, it would lock it by using its sector number. It would write its sector number as a file into a, a directory, a network directory. If that file already existed, that meant somebody else had already locked it. Once you saved a sector, it would save it, confirm that it, the data had saved correctly, and then remove that file lock. This was basically the only way we knew how to do it back then because file creation is atomic. So if two people tried to lock it at the same time, one would create the file and the other would get file already exists. So basically creating a file was an atomic operation and the name of the file, which is the sector number we knew was unique. So anyway, you would create, if you went into a world edit, world editor into a particular sector to modify it, we would just remember the differences. So let's say you opened it up, it would procedurally generate it. It would take the base terrain and I had algorithms for all the different base terrains of how to create the tiles within it. So let's say it was a grassy area, it would put down a couple plants, maybe a tree here and there, boulders, flowers, whatever. It did that by seeding a random number generator with that sector's unique sector number. So that random number generator would always generate the same random props to put onto the map. This meant that every time you loaded that sector, no matter what machine you were on, whether you had ever loaded it before, you would always see those props in the same locations, the same props in the same locations. Then when you, if you decided to edit that sector, let's say you changed some tiles, let's say you you know, deleted one of those trees or put another tree over here, it would remember those deltas as changes, adds and removals and store that as the sector's data, which meant if you only made three changes, that sector would get only stored with three deltas. So that it was a very efficient way of storing a sector. When Anybody else would then load that sector. It would look up the base terrain type and the sector number, generate the sector, then go through the list of deltas, making any changes, any additions, and any removals that you did. So then it would load up and you would see that sector the same way the other person just edited it. It was very cool. However, we leveraged this in game by the player. For example, if the player dropped an item in a sector, we would just add that as a delta. And this was really cool. Items knew, were they in a sector in a world, in which case they could store that. This is the map and sector I'm on. Or am I in a container or a creature? In both cases, there's an XY of where they're located, either an XY in the world or an XY in the inventory grid that we use. And items would store that. So that could be stored as a delta. If you dropped, say, a sword, if you want, went to a random sector and dropped a sword in the game, we just said this sword, which we referenced by its object ID, is at this location. So we generated a delta on that map. The sword would also confirm its location because it remembered where it was. I could go into it, but prototypes work the same way. If you had a sword, it just pointed to its prototype ID of the prototypical sword. The only thing that would have to be stored in that sword is any delta. So if a, if a designer had made a magic sword that had fire on it, we might change the art ID and the damage range and the damage type. Trivial. When you're in the game and the weapon gets damaged, we would store its current health, health, health points as a delta. So if it said it had 20 health, it had 20 health. But then you looked up the max health in the prototype because that would never change. So that was pretty cool. By the way, we had plans for much bigger deltas in sectors. The world editor lets you put down structures and those were also stored as deltas. We were going to let players make structures, which would have been really cool. And they did that later in Fallout 4. We also had spells that could maybe change terrain type, maybe for a, a period of time, maybe permanently. And we could do that by just putting deltas in the sectors. We never implemented these things, but it's there. And I thought that was really cool. Um, wow. I've already gone on for almost 50 minutes. Notice I haven't really gone into detail about how structures are done. We also had something called facades. Facades were pre-rendered tiles that were laid down in a particular order. We used facades for things like certain large buildings in Tarant. Uh, the crashed blimp was a facade. The rule for facades were 
Uh, they didn't have to transition to anything. They were just laid down in the order the artist said, and that facade number was stored with an offset so that it knew exactly how to draw it into the map. Then it drew all the other tiles, not trying to transition into the facade uh, tiles, and facade tiles were automatically marked as blocked. Yeah, and between sectors having unique numbers and just storing their deltas and prototypes being the same way, we saved so much memory. And it also was the reason that Arcanum's world map was so big and could have been magnitudes of size bigger. We just didn't want a world that big. But you could create it with the world editor that shipped with the game. Anyway, I hope that was an interesting view into procedural terrain generation in a 90s isometric RPG.